Welcome to this tutorial on visualization for constraint programming. I'm Helmut Simonis. I'm from the Insight Center for Data Analytics in Cork in Ireland. And I'm Guido Tuck from the Department of Data Science and AI at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. So there's a few takeaway messages for you from this tutorial. And the first one is that visualization can help you at different stages of the development process. And it really helps you to discover problems early on. Um, it also is important for understanding what is happening without drowning in too many details. So with visualization can provide this level of abstraction for you. Um, another aspect is that it helps you communicate with stakeholders who don't have experience with CP. So that's really important to have a visual representation of what you're doing for them. Now, on the technical side, um, you may have to decide how much integration with the solver you need in order to use certain types of visualization. And we can really see that complex use cases require visualization to be practical. And another aspect we will, we will touch on is that um, we have some generic visualizations, but we sometimes also need application-specific visualizations. So we have all kind of interesting things prepared for you. If you have only come uh, to this presentation for the special effects, uh, then um, we have some good things for you as well. Uh, you see a few screenshots uh, on um, the pre video stream uh, now. And this is uh, uh, showing you what you can expect uh, during uh, the tutorial. So here's an overview of what we're going to cover in this tutorial. So we'll start with a classification of modeling problems. So that is all the issues that might arise when you model um, an industrial real-world optimization problem. And then we will cover four areas where you can use visualization to understand these modeling issues. And those areas are that the model is inconsistent, that the solver starts but simply doesn't return a result, that there's no further improvement after the solver finds an initial solution, or that a user rejects um, a solution that the solver thinks is valid. But before we start, let me give you a bit of background on Helmut. So Helmut has been working in constraint programming for a very long time, um, and he has a very strong focus on application-oriented research, so really taking the technology that's developed in our community into industry and actually making it work and finding out what we need to do to make it work. Um, he's currently a partner in the Assistant um, Horizons 2020 um, EU project, um, which has a component that is about visualization and constraint acquisition. And he's focused on industrial case studies from a number of industrial partners. Um, and we will see some examples of that in this tutorial as well. Guido has been working at Monash University in Melbourne in Australia for quite a while. Um, he has been working on Minisync. Um, and on G-Code, um, two of the main constraint programming systems, uh, which contain quite a lot of visualization tools uh, in their IDE already. And Guido has been working in particular on the search tree visualization uh, in GIST uh, for G-Code and uh, the Minisync IDE, the Interactive Development Environment, uh, as well as working on a number of industrial projects where visualization was used. So what is visualization used for? Um, we are considering a number of different roles. Um, in particular, we uh, explain how to use it to help build the model. Um, but you can also use it to explain the results to different stakeholders or allow communication between the stakeholders um, and in general build confidence uh, in the system. Uh, what is important as well, uh, you will find uh, that uh, it's a very good way of presenting results to management or the funding agency or the general public. Um, people really like visualizations to understand what you're doing. Okay, the focus of the tutorial will be on building and maintaining um, the model of your problem and uh, basically use this as a helpful tool uh, to overcome some of the issues that will, you will encounter uh, during development. And we have a problem classification of uh, different issues that uh, arise when modeling and solving models, and we will show different aspects of visualization that can be used at different uh, times in the development process. Uh, so we are concentrating on using visualization as a tool for the developer in this uh, tutorial. 
Um, it is useful to remember that it's not just used when you develop the model initially, but also when you want to expand or maintain it. Uh, because typically you will understand the visualization uh, much better than the code that you have written half a year or a year uh, before. There are other things you can do with visualization, uh, but we're not covering this in detail. Um, you can use it uh, to improve the solver itself, and that is uh, a very valuable tool uh, to understand what is going on. Um, also, if you're using uh, a system, you can use the visualization to understand uh, what the solver is actually doing and uh, basically use that to uh, come up with changes in the model. Um, this is obviously then also useful as a teaching aid uh, if uh, you want to explain to other people what constraint programming is and uh, what different tools are actually doing when they are trying to solve the problem. And finally, I should mention the outreach. Um, this, this is a very helpful tool if you want to attract students, if you want to show this to the general public. Uh, they can actually be uh, quite uh, interested in your area um, with uh, the right use of visualizations. There's an important distinction to make between a generic toolkit uh, that can be used for multiple purposes and uh, something that uh, uh, is a very problem-specific visualization. Uh, with a toolkit, you basically uh, need to adapt uh, the, uh, the toolkit to your particular problem. You probably need to do some form of programming or customization, and the toolkit may not be able to do everything you want, uh, uh, but it should get you there quickly, and you should be able to use it at the beginning of the project because the toolkit is already there. Um, and uh, you can reuse components that you have used in one project for another project much easier this way. Um, a problem-specific visualization, obviously the sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want uh, if you have enough time but the budget will be an issue uh, that you have to worry about. Here we have uh, um, a relatively simple problem-specific tool. This is the Sudoku tool uh, from uh, Howell and others uh, in Ichikai 2018, uh, a tool where uh, you can see how constraint solvers deal with uh, um, the different consistency techniques used to solve Sudoku puzzles. And you have different elements of the user interface. Uh, you see the puzzle itself. Uh, you can interact with that. You can see what is happening inside uh, um, the uh, database that you have. And you can choose different methods. And then you basically can interact with the system. Um, but it's dedicated to solving the Sudoku puzzle. Um, you cannot easily use it for something else. In contrast, you have the CPVis tool that uh, we developed at UCC a few years back. And here we see an example also of a Sudoku puzzle, uh, but inside a lesson that we generated from uh, the visualization. Um, so um, it has a lot less interaction with the solver uh, than um, a dedicated tool, um, but it is available from the start of uh, the process and uh, you can integrate it easily into um, producing slides, lectures, and reports. What is common to both examples is that uh, they are both focusing on the solution process, not on the solution. So they are not typical of the things that we want to show in this tutorial. Um, these are good to understand how CP solves a particular problem and how to configure the solver to change the process um, but it's not focused on modeling the problem or checking that the solution is correct. And this is what we want to do with this tutorial. So we have a number of fundamental types of visualizations uh, that are used for constraint programming, and I'll just have a, a quick overview here. So we have uh, typically an assignment check um, where you have an assignment of the variables to values, and you want to see whether they satisfy the constraint or not. And uh, that's useful at the beginning of the process, um, but also if you make a change to your model to see that the constraints are still uh, satisfied. 
uh, you have a different view, the capacity view, uh, which tells you how tight uh, the constraint is. Here in this view, it says, for example, for an all different constraint, um, how many values are in the domains of each of the variables. And you see that some variables have a lot fewer uh, values in their domain than others. And uh, um, this curve here tells you how often a value is in the domain of a variable. Um, and that gives you an overview of how difficult will it be to solve this problem. The, this problem, or is is it uh, the bottleneck uh, of uh, the problem that we are looking at? And this is useful when you set up uh, a problem from data and you want to understand the input data a bit more. Um, the a failure explanation would be a different visualization where you try and understand why something doesn't have a solution. And so what you see here for the all different constraint again is in green and the domains of the variables. And then in red, you see um, a failure explanation, basically uh, a subset of uh, um, the variables which don't allow uh, an, a solution assignment. You have uh, another type of visualization um, that uh, can be used during search and uh, can be used to explain what uh, um, is happening um, with uh, uh, the constraint during an assignment. And you show the propagation uh, of uh, um, the constraint. This is from the Eclipse e-learning course I did uh, some years back. Um, again, the all different constraint and showing if you assign this at this current step, um, you remove these values and these are the remaining values that are left in the domain. And finally, <clears throat> very often you have um, a special visualizer to show a solution, but not necessarily uh, in a generic form, but application specific. Here, for example, we have uh, something from a, a stand allocation system for an airport. Um, and we have an all different constraint, uh, basically saying that uh, at no point in time can you have um, two planes in the same stand at the same time. Um, but uh, you want to present this in form of the application, not uh, as a generic tool. We now come to our classification of modeling problems. And we first want to show how this fits into the overall development process. Um, there is surprisingly little work uh, on describing how to develop and maintain models. Uh, little work on the methodology on, on how to do constraint programming at a big scale. Um, there is a foundational piece of work uh, from the European Chick2 project. And uh, Kam Jove has a number of papers uh, uh, on this. And you have uh, a diagram showing the timeline of a uh, constraint uh, application on the right. Um, but I'm not aware of papers in the last 10 years talking about methodology, really. Um, the problems that we are going to talk about uh, occur at different points in the project timeline. And some of these problems can reoccur at uh, later stages as well, and you have to be aware of that. So um, here we have our classification. We don't really have time um, to uh, discuss everything in this tutorial. A few of these items, like point number two, are covered in the slides uh, in more detail. Uh, but we'll focus on just four points in um, the uh, presentation. Uh, the first one is where the model is inconsistent and uh, it fails at uh, startup or it fails after some search. And depending on your system, you may or may not be able to differentiate uh, those. And this is an important uh, point where visualization can be helpful. Uh, the second uh, scenario will be uh, where the solver starts, uh, but it doesn't return an answer in a reasonable amount of time. And you basically have to understand what is happening and how can I change my model so that I will find a solution. Um, then the third case that we are going to look at is uh, where we find some initial solutions in an optimization problem, uh, but then the system gets stuck and uh, uh, doesn't produce any more solution and doesn't really finish. 
Um, and it could be that uh, we have found the optimal solution and uh, are not able to prove optimality, or it is that uh, we simply don't have uh, um, the right search strategy and uh, we have not really explored enough of the search tree um, to really find the optimal solution. And uh, finally, we have a case here at point number 11, where uh, the solver finds a solution. And when you show this to the user, the user says, yes, this is fine. Uh, this is a, a feasible solution, but I don't really like it. I want something else. And uh, uh, that is a, a tough problem uh, to uh, sort out uh, because it is a viable, a feasible solution, um, but uh, the user is still not happy. I'm now going to go through some visualization techniques that we can use to understand models that are unsatisfiable or inconsistent. So what if the model is simply rejected at startup? So you, you basically start your solver and it simply says unsatisfiable or no. We can essentially use two main concepts to deal with this situation. The first one is to compute so-called minimum correction sets or minimum unsatisfiable sets. And what these sets are is essentially subsets of the constraints in your problem. And in the case of an MUS, um, that subset on its own is already unsatisfiable. And if you remove any of the constraints from the set, the rest becomes satisfiable. So it kind of gives you a minimal explanation of what's wrong in your model. And there can be multiple MUSs for the same model um, at the same time. Uh, MCSs are kind of the dual concept of that. Um, it's basically a subset of the constraints in your problem such that if you remove that subset from the model, the rest of the model becomes satisfiable. And again, if you leave any of them out, any of the constraints out of that um, MCS, then the rest of the model stays unsatisfiable. So an MCS can explain how to make a problem satisfiable. Um, there's actually a nice overview of some of these techniques in the Holy Grail workshop at CP this year, and we've put a pointer to that here as well. Um, the other approach would be where for example, an MUS algorithm tells you that there's a single global constraint in your problem that's already unsatisfiable just by itself. Um, and then you may want to look into the structure of that particular global constraint to understand um, why it's unsatisfiable. And this can be not trivial if, for example, the global constraint has lots of parameters and ranges over a large part of the variables in your problem. So let's look at MCSs and MUSs first. The algorithms for computing MCSs and MUSs are typically based on some kind of search. So for example, um, the typical algorithms would be something like Quick Explain or Marco, and there's a bunch of other algorithms that, that do the same thing. And what they essentially do is that they enable and disable constraints systematically, um, kind of narrowing down the subsets of the constraints until they find some, um, something that is um, really a minimal unsatisfiable set, for example. Now, the problem with these algorithms is to interpret the results that they give us. Because it's not much use to us if they tell us, well, these 100 basic constraints that the solver is dealing with together are unsatisfiable. We need to understand the unsatisfiability at the level of the conceptual model that we wrote initially. And maybe we even want to translate the unsatisfiability into the language that our end users can understand. So here's an example of using an MUS detection algorithm and um, how we can actually interpret the results. So here's a Latin squares puzzle that we're going to use to, um, to illustrate uh, MUS detection. So you can see it's a Latin square of size uh, three by three. We've got an, all different constraints for the rows, all different constraints for the columns. And then we try to implement some symmetry breaking here. Um, and so it's a Lex less constraint that compares each, like adjacent rows and a less greater constraint that compares um, adjacent columns. And of course, this is not a great idea because um, those two would be incompatible. And so if we try to solve this, we just get unsatisfiable as a result. So how do we analyze this? Well, let's assume that we wanted to use um, a mixed integer programming solver like CoinBC to solve this problem. Then at the flat sync level, so the level that the solver actually gets to see um, this is actually what the solver would see. We've got a bunch of 0, 1 variables here, and then lots and lots of um, linear, linear constraints um, with um, linear inequations or linear equations. 
Um, and basically that's the representation. Now we can try and run an MUS detection algorithm on this representation, basically at the level of where we solve the problem. And there's an MES detection algorithm built into Minisync, and I can just run that. If I do that, I get an MUS pretty quickly, um, but of course it's at the level of the solver. So I can even click on these and then Minisync will show me in like colors um, which of the constraints are involved in this unsatisfiable set. But of course that's not very useful, right? I don't have any idea what this linear less than constraint actually means in terms of the high level model that I wrote. So this doesn't help me fix the problem and it doesn't help me communicate what's wrong with the problem to an end user. So going back to the original um, problem here, the MES detection algorithm that's built into Minisync actually works at the level of the model. So it can tell you which constraints are conflicting at the level of the high level model that you wrote. So if I run the same MUS detection algorithm again on the high level model rather than the low level solver model, I again get an MUS, but it already looks a bit cleaner. It's much smaller. If I click on this one, I see that there's exactly this set of constraints that are involved in the unsatisfiable set. And I can even see um, like which loop iterations or which columns and rows are involved in the unsatisfiable set. So that'll give me a much better idea where to look for the problem and how to fix it. We can visualize how the algorithm actually works internally as well. So in this visualization, you see kind of the top level structure of your model uh, at the top. And then we can see that the algorithm kind of dives down into deeper and deeper parts um, of the model, into deeper and deeper decompositions of the constraints. Um, and using this kind of grouping of constraints based on the model level structure, we can calculate the MUSs um, more quickly, and we can also explain the MUSs at the level of the, the model that the user wrote, um, which makes it much easier to, to really understand what's going on and much easier to translate the MUSs into something that the end user or the industrial client uh, would understand. Here's an example of a visual tool for representing MUSs. So this tool that was developed by some colleagues of mine um, visualizes a large water network. So on the right-hand side here, you see the network structure itself. The squares are large water reservoirs, and the edges between the squares represent water pipelines that are used to transfer water between the reservoirs and into the city. Now, the problem here is not that the model itself is unsatisfiable, right? Because that would be maybe at the debugging stage of the model initially or so. But the problem here really is that the user can add um, additional constraints on top of the model. So for example, they can say that I want the level of water in this reservoir to be below a certain level in this particular month of the year. Or I want the minimum and maximum amount of water transferred through this pipeline to be well, between these two um, bounds and things like that. And so those additional user constraints that are imposed from the outside typically cause the unsatisfiability. And that's why we need to understand and explain those unsatisfiabilities at the level that the user understands. And that's exactly what this tool is doing. So in the top left, you can see a textual representation of the MUSs. So you can see multiple MUSs that you can select here, and then a textual representation in a language that the end user understands. Um, and then there's a graphical representation again below, which represents the attributes that are kind of conflicting and the objects that are conflicting and a graph structure that tells you how those are related. And again, in the graphical representation of the network, we see the same kind of color scheme that indicates that there's something wrong, for example, with this set of transfer lines um, and they, they are conflicting or the, the attributes that the user set for those transfer lines are conflicting. Here's another version of the same tool, but for a different application. So again, you can see a graphical representation of the problem domain. In this case, it's basically a 2D packing problem, and we have constraints such as minimum and maximum distances between different components that need to be packed. Um, and again, you can see a textual representation in the language that, for example, the engineers would understand who are the, the end users of this tool, and a graphical representation um, that captures an overview of the MUSs in this problem. So, Again, this is a really important aspect of the problem that we can translate from something that's happening 
quite deep down in the solver that certain solver level constraints together are unsatisfiable and we translate that into a very high level graphical and textual representation that an end user would understand. So the other aspect I mentioned earlier is when, for example, our MES detection um, tells us that there's a single global constraint that's already unsatisfiable. So in that case, what we can do is we can expose part of the logic of the global constraint, part of the filtering or propagation algorithm, um, and capture that in a visualization. So for example, representing hall sets of an all different constraint as we've seen before. So that way, if you have enough understanding of the underlying problem, that can give you a really good idea of what's going on and why the current um, model is unsatisfiable. Another thing we can do is we can expose uh, basically information about what the solver is doing to arrive at that um, um, unsatisfiability in the form of, for example, a trace of the internal solver events. And we, we actually have several formats that have been proposed for these kind of traces, um, some more from the logic programming community, some from the Boolean satisfiability community. And um, so basically analyzing these trace files can also give us an idea of why something is failing. And the third approach here is a bit more of a research challenge. Um, so if we're using SAT-based or clause learning based methods, then typically the failures are quite well captured because we have these implication graphs and um, we, we have a, met a method for extracting reasons for failures from the solver. But at the same time, these failures happen at a very low level of abstraction, right? They're talking about individual clauses and Boolean variables. So it's not so clear that um, we can translate that into a language that the end user would understand, for example. So I think this is an interesting research challenge, how to take this internal solver representation and map it into something that an end user would understand. If we have the case that the model is inconsistent, but the solver requires some search to actually prove the inconsistency, we can still use the same techniques essentially. So in this case, typically what it means is that the constraints are not strong enough to just detect infeasibility at the root node of the search. Um, so we could try and infer some stronger lower bounds to just force it to fail earlier. I mean, that's, that would be useful in this case. Um, but the MUS based method still works. So we can still use tools that compute um, MUSs. Um, it just means that they might be a lot slower. Um, in fact, the examples that I showed you earlier um, are of this kind. So um, in the Latin squares example, in the water management example, and in the 2D packing example, the solvers typically fail after some search, but the tools still work for this. And it's really kind of a trade-off whether you can wait an hour or so to compute the MUSs. I guess if it's a very important decision um, and not a time critical one, like in the 2D packing one I, sh I showed you, that's actually fine. Um, in some other cases, maybe um, it has to be much more interactive and much more um, um, online. And in, in those cases, of course, these methods um, wouldn't work as well. Next, we're going to look at the situation where the solver starts, but then simply doesn't return a result. So in this case, maybe the model is completely correct, but we simply didn't implement a good enough search so that the solver simply can't actually explore the search tree in an efficient way. Or the model is indeed over-constrained, and the constraints are too tight, but the search space is so large that the solver is not able to detect infeasibility in a reasonable amount of time. So if we relax some of the resource limits or turn some constraints into soft constraints or things like that, then maybe we would be able to find solutions. So understanding what's happening in these cases sometimes requires access to the internals of the solver to really understand what's going on. So the analysis we want to do here has really two aims. We want to, on the one hand, understand what is happening in the solver. And on the other hand, we want to then extract suggestions that tell us how to improve the behavior. So we can look at different visualizations that can help us with this. The first one is a very prominent one, and that's just to display the search tree. And then after that, we'll also see displays of search depth or heat maps. So what can we learn from these visualizations? There's different aspects. So for example, how far do we actually progress in the search? How far do we backtrack when the solver backtracks? 
is the value selection method working? So is the search strategy that we've chosen working properly? Do we get stuck in an infeasible branch? So does the solver basically dive into a large subtree that doesn't contain any solutions, but it can't exhaust the search there? And can we maybe cut off infeasible branches using propagation by adding additional constraints? So let's look at some search tree displays first. Um, this is um, one of the early ones from 1997. Um, this is the Oz Explorer developed by Christian Schulte as part of the Mozart Oz um, constraint programming system. And you can see basically all the common concepts of search tree displays here. You have um, a root node that's the initial start point of the solver. And then you've got basically branches that represent the different decisions that a solver is making at every point during the search. In this case, we can see these red triangles that represent collapsed failed subtrees. So each of these triangles could actually hide um, a huge amount of search that was completely unsuccessful. And then finally, you've got the green diamonds here that represent solutions in the search. Um, this is one way of representing search trees. There have been many other approaches. For example, these are two from around the same time. Um, on the right, you see the CLP GUI, uh, which is more from the context of constraint logic programming. Um, you can see that the, the actual tree display is quite different to the OS Explorer. It looks much more linear when there's basically these dives um, in the search. But what you can also see here is that um, it's sometimes interesting to put additional information into the tree. Like for example, here, it tells us what kind of labeling um, has been going on in the tree. Um, on the left, you also see one of these much more linear trees with information really drawn into each of the nodes. And for example, you can see the depth of the tree um, here, and it's maybe a bit easier to compare across depth levels compared to um, the tree we saw in the Oz Explorer earlier. ILOG Solver, so basically the, the predecessor to the current um, CP Optimizer framework, also had an integrated um, solver debugger. And this is um, a screenshot directly from the documentation for that debugger. And you can see that the trees look similar, a similar color scheme and similar kind of um, symbols, like the failed subtrees with the triangles there. But the interesting thing here is that the debugger actually had this integrated view where you could have um, a model specific visualization here. So this is for the N Queens problem. So you can actually see the chessboard layout there. You had the search tree in the same view. And then you had um, a more textual view that would let you look at individual decisions or individual propagation steps inside the solver. So it gives you really deep insight into what's going on. And here's another um, example. Um, this one is from CPVis. We'll look at the failure level display a bit later, and you can see the tree display um, again, very similar. Where, where you just see the branching structure uh, in the problem, and then finally, this is something that um, one of my students did a few years ago, where the aim was to visualize very large trees. So if your tree has millions of nodes, then the kind of visualizations we saw earlier kind of break down because you can't really get an overview of the overall large-scale structure of the tree anymore. But with these um, so-called pixel trees, you can see that you actually get an overview of the structure of the tree. And you, you get these kind of repeating patterns that might um, draw your attention to different parts of the tree. And then you can zoom in and use the more traditional tree views um, just for those parts of the tree. The other interesting thing here is that in a pixel tree, the horizontal axis actually represents time in a way. So um, a node that's drawn further to the right happens later during the search. And that is not true in the, in the other um, tree representations. So if we go back to this one, for example, you can see that there's some overlap here, right? So a node that's drawn here is not necessarily later in the search than a node that's drawn here because there's overlap uh, in the branches of the tree. So that allows you to have other information basically mapped at the same horizontal um, coordinate as the corresponding nodes in the tree. And we've been experimenting with things like failure depth, domain reduction, stuff like that, that give you additional insight into what the solver is doing. So I've tried to come up with kind of a feature matrix for different tree visualizations. Um, the features I went with were whether the visualiz visualization is scalable to millions of nodes, whether you can compress um, failed subtrees or uninteresting subtrees, um, whether it's online, which means that um, 
you get the tree already partially visible while the solver is still exploring it. Interactive search means whether you can actually drive the search through the user, user interface. And then solver state access means whether you can have a look inside the solver state in each node. And for example, have a look at the, um, as we saw earlier, at the end queens problem, what's the state of the chessboard at that particular point in the search. And finally, whether the tool is solver independent, so whether you can use it with um, a range of different backend solvers. And as you can see, none of the tools actually ticks all of the boxes, which is not really um, surprising. So for example, my experience with developing GIST is that some of these are really almost mutually exclusive. So getting, um, for example, interactive search and deep solver state access makes it very different, makes it very difficult to be solver independent at the same time. So um, yeah, as you can see, none of these tools really achieves all these things. It's always uh, a bit of a trade-off. So I want to show you an example of how you can use um, the tree representation to analyze what's going on in your model. Here's a little clustering problem that I'm going to use to illustrate how you can find some inefficiencies in your model by looking at the search tree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the Minizink um, profiler that's, that's built into the Minizink IDE. Um, and you can see it's now searching the tree. This is actually online, so it's building the tree while, while, while it's going. Now it's finished. So as you can see, some of the subtrees here are hidden. Um, so let's unhide them. And that actually reveals that this is a very large tree uh, and maybe just looking at it like this doesn't tell me that much. So the first thing I can do is I can zoom out a bit and look at this in pixel tree view, where I have this nice compression feature, um, which actually gives me kind of an overview of the tree, a bit like a minimap um, in um, a source code IDE. So we can see that there's a lot of repetition. So all of these subtrees here look very similar. So maybe, maybe something's going on there. Um, so there's another tool in here that I can use if I'm a bit suspicious about um, repeated subtree. So there's a similar subtree analysis, and it basically gives us a histogram of different subtrees sorted by size. And I can see, okay, there's one here, for example, that has 49 nodes, and it appears 504 times. So if I click on that one, those subtrees all get highlighted in the tree view, right? So we can see all of these subtrees that have basically an identical shape. And now if I look at the trees, I can display the labels um, for the search in those trees. And let's maybe open two of those and see what the differences are. So you can see all of these are doing something about cluster 50 uh, at the top here, right? This one also does something about cluster 50. So cluster 50 not equal to two, cluster 50 not equal to two, that's the same. And then cluster 50 equals four, whereas here cluster 50 equals three. So something seems to be going on. Right, it's basically the same structure. It's talking about the same kind of clusters here, cluster 18 and cluster 50. Uh, same thing here, cluster 18, cluster 50. And so if I spend a little bit more time analyzing this, um, it will be quite obvious that there's um, a value symmetry in this problem that I didn't break in my model. Um, and so if I go back to my model, and just basically enable this symmetry breaking constraint that I commented out earlier. Um, and then do the same thing again and profile the search. We can see that the resulting tree is a lot smaller. Um, actually, if I unhide all the hidden subtrees, I think it'll still be quite clear that, that this tree is a lot smaller. It's going basically straight to the solutions uh, with, a, with a lot less um, repeated structure. So you can see these are some of the tools that you can use to get an overview of what the search is doing and then drill down into individual parts of the search, look at what the solver state is in different nodes in the search tree, and then draw some conclusions from that to help you improve the model. Okay, so what are some of the challenges with the tree visualizations as we've seen them just now? I think um, the biggest challenge is how to visualize some of the more modern search techniques such as clause learning, kind of heuristics, restarts, back jumps, non-chronological search, best first search, things like that. Um, because none of these really fit into this kind of tree paradigm. Um, and I think 
several people have tried to incorporate um, search strategies like that into um, tree visualizations, but I don't think that's been really successful. And then the other aspect is what can we actually learn from very large trees? So if our search tree has millions of nodes, how can we actually effectively navigate that and really tease out information that can help us improve the model, for example? I don't think that's a solved problem, so that could be still very interesting to look into. So let's now look at some um, related um, visualizations that also tell us something about the search without actually visualizing the search tree itself. So this is a search depth display where um, the graph actually tells us for each depth level in the tree, how many nodes appear at that depth level. And so here you can see three different, um, basically three different variants of an algorithm or variants of a model. You, can, you could um, think of it either way um, and how they behave in terms of nodes per depth level. You can see that all of them kind of have this exponential increase. So the tree size grows exponentially with, with depth. And note that the um, vertical axis is in logarithmic scale. And then at this depth of around, I don't know, 16, 17, um, the blue algorithm starts leveling off and then actually goes down quite quickly. Whereas the green and red algorithms keep on growing exponentially to much larger tree sizes. So that can give you an idea um, of how the search is performing overall. So even though the algorithms kind of converge at the um, deeper levels and explore similar sized trees at those deeper levels, there's clearly a, a very big difference in efficiency here at the earlier levels. And that, that can give you some additional insight that maybe um, would be difficult to grasp if you just had a look at, at a tree with millions of nodes. Um, and the final one I want to look at is this heat map display. So here we can see basically a comparison between two different search strategies. And what the visualization shows us is um, for each depth level, which of the variables were actually assigned at that, le at that depth level. So, and there's a special kind of sorting that we do for the variables for this to make sense. Basically, what we can see on the left is with this search heuristic, which used to be, which I think was DOM over WDEC, yeah? With this search heuristic, um, basically all of the depth levels, so over a broad range of depth levels, most of the variables were assigned, right? So the search isn't very focused. It has a very broad area that it's trying to um, search over. Whereas on the right, we have DOM over DEC, which often is um, a weaker search strategy. Um, and in this case, we can see that the, that the search is much more focused, right? So it's a much narrower range of depth levels and a smaller set of variables that are actually assigned on those depth levels. And so that can give you an idea whether the search is actually focusing on the right variables. And if it isn't, then maybe um, you can change something in your model to um, make it easier for the search to uh, find the variables that are really effective for searching over in your model. We now look at the next scenario uh, where we have some initial solution that we find for an optimization problem, um, but then no further improvement. And uh, this can be due to two basic scenarios. One where we are not finding a better solution due to the limitation of the search method that we're using. Or we have found the optimal solution, but we are not able to prove optimality of the solution. And both uh, methods, uh, both uh, scenarios uh, need slightly different approaches. So uh, first, uh, we're looking at the limits of the search routine. Um, some of the search methods that we might be using are good at finding initial solutions of relatively high quality, uh, but they are poor at exploring the complete search space, uh, whereas others are um, rather weak at getting initially good solutions, uh, but they are effective uh, in exploring the search space. And uh, um, these things uh, basically can stop uh, our search uh, uh, finding the solution because we are not updating the cost function properly. Uh, we are making repeatedly bad choices or repeatedly choices that we have already explored. 
and therefore we have deep backtracking in our search tree. Uh, just adding a lower bound is not helping in this case um, because uh, um, we don't really prune um, the, the search with a lower bound. Um, what we want to do here is we want to add constraints uh, to update the cost earlier in the tree or we want to explore the search tree only partially. And we are using as a running example a simple scheduling problem. It's a flow shop type problem where we have a set of jobs consisting of a series of tasks uh, that have to be processed on the machines in the same order. We have some precedence constraints between the task of the same job and we have disjunctive constraints uh, and uh, the task on uh, those machines basically compete for uh, the use of the machine. And then we have some operator uh, resource constraint where during the initial part of uh, a task we need an operator uh, and we have a cumulative limit uh, uh, for this. We have here our conceptual model in MiniSync. We're not going to talk about that in detail. Uh, and here we have an example solution um, where we see a visualization as a Gantt chart here. Uh, at the top, uh, we have the machines as our, our resources and then the tasks uh, that are executed. And we have another visualization which shows us the cumulative resource profile uh, for the operator use. Uh, and we see that uh, in this particular solution, we are using two operators uh, um, to uh, run uh, the schedule and achieve uh, an overall cost of 131. And now we're comparing three search methods uh, for this problem. One, um, which is the chuffed uh, uh, free search. Uh, it starts uh, very poorly here at an upper bound, um, but steadily increases and eventually finds and proves the optimality of uh, the best solution. Um, in contrast, we have here in red um, uh, user-specified uh, in-search, uh, which is uh, quite good at finding a good initial solution, but then gets stuck after a few seconds and never produces anything better uh, and is not able to find the optimal solution and uh, is also not able to prove optimality. And we have in blue uh, combination of these two where we have the free search uh, with the in search annotation. Um, it basically starts uh, quite well here and then also finds the uh, optimal solution and proves optimality. And so we have to decide when we develop an application, um, in which of these different cases are we? Um, are we just starting very poorly here at the beginning um, and we're improving, but perhaps slowly? Or are we at a case where we have uh, a good initial solution, but then get stuck? And for that, we can use uh, an estimate of uh, the cost as uh, a visualization uh, in this form here, where we have uh, the death of the search tree um, that we are exploring on the x-axis and the lower bound of the cost variable on the y-axis. And at time zero, uh, at depth zero, um, we have the initial bound of 66, which is due to the longest job in our data set here. And we see how the cost estimate increases as we assign more and more variables. And at the end, we get a solution which is uh, uh, not optimal, uh, something like 137. Um, and uh, we see the final update here is for the last two uh, variables. So um, this is not a very good estimate uh, of uh, the cost um, and uh, if we use the same search routine to find the optimal solution so we impose a bound of 132 above here um, we see that we again start uh, at 66 and then we continue to increase and here um, we are seeing the backtracking that occurs uh, um, for these different estimates of cost at different levels of the of the search and eventually we find uh, the optimal solution and uh, we finish our search. Uh, so what we're seeing is that we're backtracking basically in this part, in this uh, depth of the tree, after assigning um, something like 15 to 30 variables. And we're exploring a lot of different combinations uh, before uh, we find our optimal solution. So the task is, can we do better than that? 
Um, the other problem would be where we have uh, a proof of optimality that uh, doesn't finish uh, quickly enough. Um, you can argue whether a proof of optimality is uh, required in all cases, uh, but of course it's nice to have and uh, um, without the proof you don't really know that you have the optimal solution in the general case. But sometimes we are uh, interested only in a solution which is close enough to the lower bound and has some proven optimality gap. Okay, uh, important for both of these things is understanding the lower bounds that we have. Um, so we saw that the initial um, lower bound uh, that we get by propagation alone can be quite weak. Um, and uh, for a lot of problems, uh, specialized uh, problem-specific uh, bounds in the literature uh, that we could use. Um, but uh, um, they typically just compute a lower bound at the beginning of the search um, this is not updated as the search progresses and uh, we are not using it as a constraint. Uh, we can only use it to stop the search if we reach the, the, uh, the lower bound and uh, um, we have no need for any further um, proof of optimality as we have reached a, a known lower bound. But we are interested in converting these lower bounds into constraints and we are going to show an example on how to do that. Uh, for the flow shop uh, problem. So um, perhaps it's easier to use the visualization from the start. Uh, what we see here are um, different versions of uh, what is called a stage bound or a subset bound. Um, and this works as follows. Uh, we are, for example, taking here uh, the second stage of our problem. Well, we need some time to actually get uh, a job to the point where it can execute uh, on the second stage. Um, and that's this initial starting time here. Um, then we have the workload for that stage. And then we have uh, the time that is needed to finish the last uh, job that we have uh, scheduled um, through the other stages of the problem. And these three things combined, so the time to start work on the stage, uh, the workload of the stage, and then the time to finish the job uh, after that stage, uh, they make a, a very good uh, uh, bound on the overall problem. And we can use either all tasks uh, of a particular stage, or we can use subsets uh, and get uh, different versions of the bound. And here we are seeing that the, the best bound in this particular case is obtained for the last stage uh, where we get a bound of 127 uh, from uh, this calculation. And we can use that as a lower bound in our, uh, in our solver. But uh, uh, we know that the, the optimal solution is actually 131. This is not, uh, um, this is not helping us uh, to prove optimality uh, either. So here we're seeing what is going on um, for a bound for this stage here. Um, we're seeing that uh, the earlier start is at time 17, but in this optimal solution, we are not starting um, this stage at uh, time 17. Um, we're actually waiting a little bit further, and then we're also not executing all the tasks in um, this uh, stage uh, consecutively. Um, so we are not uh, reaching this minimal end, uh, we are ex extending beyond this minimal end. And therefore this bound of 122 is actually quite far away from uh, the optimal solution. So one thing we can uh, do is uh, we can convert the bound uh, to a constraint uh, by saying uh, that uh, um, well, we have this earlier start of uh, the task on this stage, we can replace that uh, by the minimum of the start times. And uh, that will give us a, a constraint that we can impose. Um, so instead of taking the earlier start, we are taking the actual start of any of the tasks in that stage and uh, then add the total amount of work that we need and the time to finish. And this allows us to push uh, the, the bound uh, from 122 to 126 um, in the case where we are starting task at uh, this point here. And uh, uh, whenever we basically assign uh, the first task uh, of this stage, uh, we are getting a, a very good update on the overall workload. 
And we can do this as well for the last stage, and this actually gives us um, a pushed uh, update of 131. So we are seeing that this really does have uh, an impact on uh, the evaluation. And if we do our visualization of the uh, search depth against the uh, cost estimate, we're seeing quite a difference here. We're starting at 127 because that's the lower bound of uh, the problem. And then we are playing um, basically within uh, just the range from 127 to 131, um, trying to find uh, an optimal solution. Uh, we're still, we're still backtracking uh, quite a bit, but uh, we're backtracking earlier uh, than before. And uh, we are using the information about the bound here as a much earlier time um, than in the previous uh, run. So if we compare um, these two visualizations um, with the same scale on the y-axis, we see um, how much better um, the improved constraint is uh, updating um, the uh, make span of uh, the overall project. Um, for this particular example, it does not reduce the search as much as we expected, um, but uh, it is uh, quite useful um, to uh, start uh, the search earlier in um, the, uh, the search tree. It can also be used uh, to compare different heuristic variable orderings, for example, quite nicely. The research question that we have to look at is uh, how do we plot uh, um, the search depth in a clause learning solver where um, the depth of the search tree varies um, with uh, um, which part of the search tree we are exploring and the variables in the search are not directly linked uh, to user-defined variables. We now come to the last uh, modeling problem that we want to investigate, and this is a case where a user rejects a valid solution. And this is the hardest case that we uh, need to study because uh, um, the model, in uh, essence, is working as intended. Uh, it's just that the user is not happy with it. It may be that we have the wrong objective and therefore find solutions um, that uh, are not quite as good as we think they are. Or it may be that we're only exploring a small part of the search tree. Or we have actually made a mistake in modeling and we should uh, change our model uh, to uh, get uh, um, the user uh, happy. Um, it could also be that the user is wrong, and uh, we have to uh, analyze that and check that as well. So uh, the argument of the user is, uh, yeah, your current solution is okay, um, but instead of uh, this, you should be doing this and that, and uh, uh, basically saying, I would uh, prefer a change in the solution, uh, and that would be a better solution. And the first thing that we need to understand is, uh, is that really possible? Is uh, this and that really uh, a change that is uh, leading to a feasible solution? Um, and uh, see whether there are solutions uh, um, that uh, would have that modified assignment in there. Um, and then the second step would be to see whether this really makes an improvement uh, with uh, our current objective function. Um, is that really a better solution as we understand quality of solutions at the moment? Um, so uh, if that's uh, uh, the case, then we can basically just rerun our solver perhaps with a different search strategy or giving it more time, and it should be able to find uh, this uh, better solution. Um, but uh, if uh, this is not uh, the case and we want to make the user happy, uh, then we should modify the objective function uh, so that it becomes a better solution uh, than the one uh, that uh, we have uh, had before. Um, we could also modify the search uh, so that we actually find uh, the, this modified assignment, um, perhaps find it earlier than uh, we would find it with our original search strategy. 
And then finally, uh, if uh, uh, this modification was not uh, uh, a feasible solution in our initial model, we might uh, change uh, and modify the model so that it becomes a feasible solution. Um, these different steps, uh, basically, we have to decide which of those things we should do and which of those things uh, lead to an improved solution for the user. Now, this is related to the concept of a counterfactual explanation in AI. Uh, this is a uh, hot topic in explainable AI. Uh, I'm just linking here two survey uh, papers uh, from uh, the last months uh, uh, on this topic. Uh, and we have seen the first papers applying this to CP as well. And actually, there is one uh, paper by uh, Korikov and Beck uh, in um, the proceedings of, of uh, the CP conference. Um, they are restricting the changes uh, uh, to the weights of the cost function, um, not uh, um, modifying the constraints of the problem themselves. Uh, and I think there is still a question uh, that needs to be answered. Uh, what is a satisfactory uh, explanation? Um, you can approach this from a model-centric uh, or a user-centric view. And you can say, well, in the model, this is actually a small change of our constraints or of our objective. And therefore, this is a, a good counterfactual. Um, whereas uh, the user might say, well, this might be a small change in the model, but this is a big change in our process. Um, whereas some of the things that the user might uh, allow uh, as small changes to the overall um, process of uh, um, producing something or doing something uh, in our optimization, um, this may actually be a, a massive change uh, uh, of the model and therefore would not be considered as uh, a good counterfactual explanation. But uh, we can also do something else and use visualization uh, directly uh, to help uh, um, with this uh, type of problem where um, we are not showing just a single solution um, that perhaps is not what the user expects, but um, showing a range of solutions and showing what is possible in the solutions. Uh, the first thing is to compare multiple solutions inside the same visualization. And that can be quite useful. And we'll see an example in a minute. Um, the uh, second case would be to show uh, how much we can change uh, the solution without really uh, modifying um, the overall uh, solution of uh, the problem and the overall decisions that we have taken to come up with the solution. Um, and uh, basically give the user um, an overview of what he can change easily and what will be more complicated. So we have uh, uh, an example based on a job shop scheduling problem. Uh, this is the Moot Thompson 10 by 10. Uh, and here we are seeing two um, optimal solutions, one obtained with Shaft and one obtained with Cplex. And this can be quite useful to compare um, these solutions uh, and see what is happening there. Um, so typically what you will find often is that uh, one task is just uh, shifted in time a little bit. Um, but we can also have uh, situations where um, the order of certain tasks is exchanged uh, in the two different solutions. And we can e have even more complicated uh, uh, modifications of the schedules. And that can be useful to understand, uh, especially if we want to see how does one solution, um, let's say a slightly improved solution, uh, differ from the previous solution that we had. Um, and uh, um, this is uh, another visualization of a Gantt chart where we are comparing basically two uh, lines of task uh, for the same resource or for the same uh, job uh, in uh, the same uh, visual display. Um, we can have another view where we are trying to show how much uh, the task can move in time. And so we have here a solution, again, optimal solution, um, where we identify how much uh, certain tasks can move without changing anything else. Uh, so we're looking at uh, a single um, task uh, that is changed while keeping everything else uh, as it is. And for example, here for task T15, 
uh, we can see that uh, we can shift it uh, quite a bit to the right, uh, but we can't shift it to the left uh, because uh, of uh, some other assignment. And uh, um, here, for example, that would be task uh, T14 um, that uh, has a precedence constraint. Uh, but we can uh, we can move this task here. Other tasks we can move uh, to an earlier time. And this visual visualization um, basically shows us what flexibility <coughs> we have uh, in our solution that we can exploit without resolving the problem at all. Um, we can have uh, a slightly different picture where we are saying, um, yeah, if we have uh, here two tasks, uh, um, we can move task uh, 38 only a little bit to the right. But uh, if we move task uh, 39 out of the way, uh, we might be able to move task 38 further to the right. And uh, um, this would be possible to see if we uh, take uh, um, the view that, uh, well, we can change multiple things in the schedule, uh, but we don't want to change uh, the order of uh, tasks on the machines. We want to keep that uh, uh, as uh, as it is in, in the initial solution. Um, and then we basically can resolve the problem um, by um, stating inequality constraints, uh, precedence constraints between uh, the task uh, on the machines as well uh, or as we have precedence constraints between um, the task uh, of the same job and uh, we can resolve that problem, and that gives us more flexibility. Uh, in order to see something like this, we would have to uh, change to a view uh, that is task-based uh, so that we uh, can see how much uh, individual tasks can move um, without uh, bumping into uh, task uh, earlier or, or, or later in uh, either the same job or on the same machine. Um, and uh, uh, for the job shop, this is very simple to do. Um, we just replace the disjunctive constraints with uh, the precedence constraints. It becomes more complicated if we have some extra constraints uh, that we need uh, to deal with, like we had in our flow shop example. Um, then this may not be a, a polynomial uh, type of, of uh, problem anymore. We now come to the end of uh, the tutorial and we want to summarize uh, a few of the things that we have discussed and a few of the things that we left out. Um, so uh, we have shown you how to use visualization in um, the process of modeling problems and how this integrates with uh, an overall development process and which tools and which uh, um, different strategies are useful to use at different points in the development process. Um, we have uh, given an overview of uh, uh, quite a lot of different tools that have been developed. Uh, uh, not all of them are alive. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, only there uh, for historical reasons, uh, but quite a few of the tools you can still download and use uh, straight away. And we have given an overview of uh, the literature in the area. Now, we have left out uh, quite a few things that we could I have talked about um, one topic uh, in particular, um, the visualizations to understand and improve a solver. And uh, a lot can be done here. Uh, this is a visualization from a paper on explaining all different. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, this can become complicated quite quickly. This explains basically how a clause learning solver uh, would uh, redu uh, reduce domains and interact uh, um, different, uh, all different constraints with each other. And uh, that is uh, uh, an interesting uh, visualization, uh, perhaps a bit too complicated uh, to automate uh, completely. Uh, we can use uh, visualization also for constraint acquisition to understand uh, from uh, sample solutions uh, what constraints uh, should be in a particular problem. This is uh, um, an example from my own work on, on constraint acquisition where um, we're seeing um, the interaction of uh, different variables in the solution, in the examples that are given. 
And from that, we can immediately derive uh, some constraints, equality, not equality constraints, uh, uh, in this visualization, which is uh, quite helpful at times. Um, we have left out uh, a lot of work on uh, visualization for local search and constraint-based local search. And we have here uh, a picture from a paper by Dooms and others from 2009 uh, describing visualization in the Comet uh, system. And uh, uh, the visualization looks slightly different from what we have seen in this tutorial uh, because we have uh, um, an initial assignment that we are working with and we are, we are modifying the assignments rather than building them uh, from uh, domain variables from scratch. One question that we also have completely ignored is how do we test uh, uh, for effectiveness of the visualization? And uh, that is uh, a question that uh, is also quite important uh, for visualization in the more general context. And uh, this is a, uh, this is a, a shot uh, from a paper that actually looks at comparing some basic visualizations with the user study and explains how this is done. Um, this obviously is a lot of work, uh, setting up a user study and comparing things. And you also have to understand um, which user level you want to, uh, you want to look at. Uh, do you want to look at uh, how easy can students learn some basic models? Or um, do you want to see how experts can solve large industrial problems? Uh, that would become a very uh, difficult challenge to um, measure the effectiveness of, of visualization. Besides the fact uh, that people say, yes, I'm, I'm very happy that I had this visualization. It helped me a lot. Um, visualizations for specific applications we left out uh, as well. And we have here an example of uh, one of my earlier systems uh, from Cositec, uh, a feed mill scheduling system where you have uh, a lot of things going on in this scan chart. And uh, everything there means something to uh, the end user. And the end user can also uh, interact with this scan chart by moving things around and uh, record what was actually happening in the factory uh, as well as how is the plan the solution changed if I change the order of uh, task and I move something in time uh, myself. And finally, we have uh, um, a different use of, of visualization, uh, visualization as opt art. Uh, and that was a, a term coined by Robert Bosch uh, in, in 2006. Um, and some of my colleagues in UCC have been working on uh, some of these problems as well. This is an example of a domino portrait. And here the visualization becomes the output of uh, um, the, uh, the solver. Um, you're interested in how well does this look or how well does this picture compare to the original picture. Um, not so much uh, what values do you assign to the individual variables. So the role of the visualization changes from being um, a supporting uh, thing that we are using to find a solution um, to being the main uh, result of uh, a run. And then finally, there is scalability um, that we haven't really addressed. Uh, how do you deal with uh, uh, the fact that you may have uh, hundreds or thousands of tasks uh, um, in a problem or millions uh, uh, of nodes in a search tree? And uh, how do you use that uh, um, and still make sense of what the visualization is uh, telling you? And then last slide, uh, are these examples available? What uh, do you have to do if you want to get involved in visualization? A lot of that is actually available in the Minisync IDE and you can download that and use the CP profiler in uh, the IDE to uh, look at the search and look at uh, uh, some of the other visualizations that are in there. Um, the material from the assistant project is not yet released, uh, but it will become available as open source and uh, we'll um, make that uh, um, available uh, to the community. Um, 
if you need uh, some visualization of this type uh, straight away, you should talk to me. Uh, then we perhaps can come to an arrangement. And the slide set uh, uh, is overall available uh, on Zenodo, um, where uh, you can have uh, a look at uh, uh, some of the parts we left out of this presentation. And uh, there's the complete bibliography uh, of uh, all the papers that we refer to uh, in the presentation as well. Thank you for attending this tutorial. Thank you, and we hope you got something interesting out of it.